put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Okay, hello ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the whatever it is edition of uh, Energy Week with George Harvey and the amazing Tom Fennell. And I have to be careful not to go too far because I'll touch the screen and knock it over on Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a microphone that probably diverted a little bit. A little bit. Either that or it would clobber you with a microphone. Um, Every day I go to the internet. Yesterday, by the way, you remember I had that panel in, the little thing from Tiny Solar Vermont? And I what said, did you do? I had a solar panel in that I showed people on. Yeah, yeah. And I told you that I had, I had bought a system that had a battery. Yeah. Well, yesterday we had a power outage that oh, lasted did a couple of hours. I'll be darned. And um, I, it started not very long after I started doing my blog, which takes a couple of, several hours. To do. Sure it does, yeah. And uh, there I was, with just in utter dark, darkness, and I said, "Now is the time. I'll try. I'll just set it up. Even if even if the power comes on, it'll be good practice." And it did take me a few minutes to set it up because I was in the dark and I wasn't really a accustomed to where everything was. I wasn't really set. Yeah, up a little for, harder to do it in the dark. <laughs> and it's a little harder to do it the first time. But nevertheless, I went back to the same monitor, the same computer, everything set up within a few minutes. And I did the entire remainder of the blog on uh, power that had been put into batteries by by that 60 watt solar panel. And, Great. Uh, when I was all done, <laughs> yeah, the um, the charge controller said the batteries were still full. I'll be darned. Isn't that something? Yeah. So what did you say? Was, say eight watts or something like that. Um, the the monitor the monitor that I just got takes yeah. eight, but the I wasn't using it. I was using the other monitor. Oh, okay. That way I didn't have to yeah. switch the monitor cables yeah. and things like that. And uh, so I that was using... more than 8 watts. I think, it, I think it actually takes something like, I don't know, 40 watts or something. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it gets warm. Okay. You, you know, if you touch the back of it, you'll feel that it's okay. warm. It gives off heat. So um, I was very pleased with the fact that I was able to do that. I like to get my, my blog posted and out by about eight o'clock mm -hmm. and then I've got a bunch of other stuff that I have to do and I like to get it all done by nine and if I had not done that with a solar panel it would have been like wouldn't have been able to do it not not before nine yeah and um, the the purpose that I've got and also I, w I had to run the modem out of that okay and uh, you know the whole everything had to be done but my experience is that is that the phone lines, which is, and I'm getting my, my internet over the phone lines. Yeah. The phone lines are almost always going even when the electricity is down. Yes, it's they an, have no connection to the electricity. Yeah, it's an entirely different system. It's very carefully on. maintained. And um, so, you know, I've, I've been four times without power for in excess of a week. I talked to my daughter uh, about that and she said the one time and I don't know if it was the, I think it was after the perfect storm. We were the, without electricity for two weeks. And some of the people where I worked with that were three. I had forgotten that. Being without power for two weeks is Up not Up until fun. recent times, and I'm talking probably the 50s at least, uh, they used these huge old fashioned batteries. Uh, for their phones? For the phones, oh, yeah. Yes. They, they, they would, well, these bad batteries are half the size of a, of a breakfast table. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and it had liquid in them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a friend anyway. of mine bought a bunch of them when they diversified and filled his swimming pool. Well, he was <laughs> no, he was living off grid. Yeah. So he was using these things. He was charging them so, with and solar. And some of those batteries, as I recall, are very long lasting. What? Well, they would last forever. Yeah. I mean, they use copper and copper sulfate and zinc. And all you had to do was replace the zinc. So there was no and the copper sulfate. There was no lead. That might have been what my great grandfather was using. 
I wouldn't be surprised. He had batteries that were, that were charged by by exchanging chemicals. Yeah, yeah. That's how you charge the darn thing. He you was replaced, the first person. You replaced in, the zinc anode. He was the first person in Plattsmouth, Nebraska to have electricity. And he was the first person in Plattsmouth, Nebraska by many years to have a telephone. Uh-huh. Yeah, you've mentioned that. So who that. do you talk? <laughs> <laughs> He had, an, he had a telephone installed at his store, and he had another one installed at the doctor's office. And the one that was installed at the store was out, out in the open where anybody could use anybody it Anybody could night. use it, yeah. So it was a kind of a public service on his, on his part. To and do. it didn't have a dial. No, 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 no <laughs> dial. I, Number, I don't know please. that he was, I don't know it even have it, had an operator. I think it probably did, but um, the well, operator... It had, had something. Well, he Unless was able was to make phone calls to St. Louis. Other telephones. And, yeah, he, he called St. Louis and Chicago. Well, he had to have an operator. He, he had to have a connection to the outside, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's get going. We're, we're falling behind, and we're already uh, six minutes into the show. Um, every day I go to the Internet. I do this uh, find news on, on uh, climate change and, um, and energy. And I put it up at geoharvey.com. If you're looking at this through BCTV or uh, YouTube or whatever, there's probably a link associated with it that you can go to the script of the show. And uh, if not, you can go to geoharvey.com, which is my, my blog, and uh, click on the appropriate date. We're starting on the 24th of September, which is a week ago today, and we start with a picture there it is. Yeah, there it is. Of it's Elon, Elon Musk talking about batteries. He had his big battery talk, and it was well, in the news constantly. There's some interesting stuff coming out of Musk and, and, and e batteries. Elon and There batteries. was a really interesting one today. Well, wouldn't surprise me. There, the, in the battery, the uh, uh, Tesla uh, plant in China, apparently, is going to start... Um, uh, selling cars with lithium ferrophosphate batteries, which means no cobalt, L-I-P-O-4, L-I-F-E-P-O-4. They're called LIFEPO-4, okay. although in the article they're just called L-F-P. Um, those batteries have no cobalt and they have no nickel. Well, it's good they get, they're getting rid of cobalt because that's kind of nasty stuff. And, and, and I guess the nickel, nickel's common, isn't it? Nickel is more common, I think, than than cobalt, but it's not. Um, so they get rid of nickel too. It must. There's got to be a reason for that. <coughs> there. Well, the nickel is expensive, and it has it well, has environmental reason. issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, they're making a lot of progress in batteries. They probably made more progress in batteries in the last year than they have on all of my life. <laughs> well, there's there's been a lot of progress, but it's interesting to me because uh, Tesla's. Um, Tesla's uh, uh, technology is based on on lithium ion batteries, and they may be moving to LifePo4 batteries. So, anyway, well, let's get started here. Yeah, the first item, which has this picture of Elon Musk, um, is uh, from Clean Technica. Six big takeaways from Tesla's Battery Day. Yep. Um, the overall content of Tesla's Battery Day pre presentation might have been overwhelming. For those who do not have a technical background, I got to tell you, even when you simplify it, a lot of people were probably <laughs> overwhelmed. You're absolutely right. Um, with people who don't have a technical background in battery development, how many people have a technical background in battery development? Last count was four. <laughs> <laughs> Given that, it might be a good idea to, as they say, pull the lens back just a little bit and discuss the major takeaways. Here are six of them. Well, I'm not going to dis. I'm not going to read the six, but if you're interested, look it up. Yeah, look it up. It's it's worthwhile. They're worth, they're worth looking at. They're, they are. We are going to be mentioning some of these as the show goes as on. As the show goes on. So and a little quick takeaway here is. Yeah. Musk says Tesla is a hardcore engineering company. <laughs> And they are. How can you possibly say They're not a car so. company. The car company? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but here they are. They're building a car around the battery instead of the other way around. Right. That's a very interesting thing. Okay. We have a picture, Another picture of a wind turbine. And this is interesting. You know, these the big companies are moving. And here is a wind turbine from GE, which is... There know, is a wind turbine there, guys. Yeah. Oh, there's, looks like there's more than one. Does it? 
I don't know. I don't know what's in the background. There's something here. in the background. There's something. It, yeah. It's tall and it's white. I can't tell if it's a wind turbine yeah. or not. This got to be. There's nothing else can. This get. news item is from Renews. Uh huh. And GE secures 576 megawatts of U.S. orders from Invenergy. Well, GE Renewable Energy announced 576 megawatts of orders from Invenergy for 187 of its 2.x onshore wind turbines. 2.x meaning that they are 2 um, megawatts plus X amount. The three contracts... There are two, will, 2 megawatt wind turbines. Well, they're 2 point... Relatively small. 2 point something. Yeah. Yeah, they could be up to 2.9 or 2, you know, but ne nevertheless, three contracts will power the equivalent of 160 American homes across the, U the United States. GE's 2 megawatt product platform has a total of more than 15 gigawatts in, of installed capacity worldwide. Well, gigawatts is bigawatts. Now, this is onshore turbines. Yeah. Which is a big business for GE. GE's been in it for a long time. Yes. And they're starting, as we'll find out in this show, to get into offshore with some very large turbines. Well, big turbines offshore. I just, I mean, you could, if you if you cut holes in the, if you had a nacelle and you, st and you cut holes in it for windows, you could live in the thing comfortably. Oh, easily. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, they're sending 50, 40 turbines to Michigan, 30 of them to <laughs> Iowa, and 97 of them to South Dakota. And they're all scheduled to be operational by the first quarter of next year. Uh, South Dakota and Iowa, you would expect a lot of wind turbines. Well, there's a lot of wind in Michigan. Michigan has got a lot of wind Central U.S. Turbines. Yeah. Michigan there has got a lot. There is a lot of wind there. Okay. Well, let's move along here. Our next item is from BW Business World. World's operating nuclear fleet at a 30-year low as new plants stall. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Some 408 nuclear reactors were operating in 31 countries in July 2020, a decline of nine units from mid-2019, and 30 fewer than the 2002 peak of 4, 438. The annual uh, World Nuclear Industry Status Report showed of the 52 new plants being built globally, at least 33 are behind schedule. Well, I'm, I got a note here, and it's uh, five S's with lines through them. Okay. An S with a line through it? The dollar sign. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. It, this is about money, guys. No. <laughs> Well, the, the nuclear are costed too much to build, to, they, to, to, they, build, to operate, you know. We're we, not, we just see that all the time. And then, and then nobody's even talking about what do we do with the... Uh, even these new ones, the, the, what they call the, the modular nuclear, uh, the small modular reactors. Yeah, they're they not aren't, going anywhere. They aren't cheaper and they, don't, and they still produce waste. They are said to be safer. But you know, I wrote a I wrote an article for a Clean Technica well, last week about that. We have developed kind of an aversion to nuclear here, and, and with good reason. I think so. Yeah. Well, let's okay. move along here. We're up to Friday, and for Friday we have a picture. You believe it or not, a picture of a Total solar farm. Total is, of course, a company that we've talked about. And this item is from Renew. I wonder what those guys are doing there. They're not. They're they're not playing cards. <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. It's, you know. I think that that's probably some kind of ceremony going on. They look too... Either even, that or it's an even instructional like, thing. Yeah. Okay. The boss is telling them how to do something. <laughs> yeah, that could be. Well, Total seals a 3.3 gigawatt Spanish solar deal. This is a rather large. Big, huh? This is more than you could fit in your backyard. Oh, this is large. <laughs> the gigawatts is gigawatts, guys. Ener uh, French energy giant Total has signed a, an agreement with Spanish company Ignis to develop about 3,300 3, megawatts, which is 3.3 gigawatts, of solar projects in Spain. The projects, lo located near Madrid and in the Andalusia region, are expected to start operations in 2022 with within the ambition of putting them all into production by 2025. It's it's it, it, every time I see this kind of stuff, I, it strikes me how fast these solar operations can be put together. Well, they're talking about more than five gigawatts by 2025. That's a that's a that's 
good sized amount. Yeah, and they're not we'll playing get, games here, guys. No, they're not. And and you know, a five year goal for 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 three point three gig, uh, gigawatts is yeah. As you said, they're not playing games. Well, so Chow will be able to cover all of its own electricity consumption in Europe, as well as supplying its customers in Spain. This is really interesting because, to, and I've been seeing this over and over again, the big um, oil companies, which Total is, it's a big yeah, oil it is, company, right. are all going to renewables in Europe. I think they see the handwriting on the wall. I think they do. I think they do. Okay, our next item, unless you've got more on that. No, but we got a picture. We do. And the next item is from PV, PV Magazine Australia. And that, those are cooling towers. I'm not sure what they're for. So I don't know that they're nuclear or coal or what. They're probably Well, not. a cooling tower could cool almost anything. So. It could. And but if, they're often associated with, with nuclear. Yeah, if they're in Australia, they're not nuclear because Australia doesn't have nuclear. But what Wes can I says say? nuclear power is the most expensive form of generation, except for gas peaking plants, and we've talked about them. They are expensive. They're expensive. Um, the levelized cost of energy from nuclear power rose from about one hundred and seventeen dollars per megawatt hour in two thousand fifteen to one hundred and fifteen fifty five dollars at last year's end. The World Nuclear Industry States report says. The LCOE for solar PVs fell from $65 per megawatt hour to about 49 and for, for wind it fell from 55 to 41. So nuclear power they're saying right now is nearly four times, the electricity is almost four times as expensive as what wind power may I said means. three. I said three, but it's almost four. Yeah. Is, yeah. And so why would you build it? Well. Good question. A little but bit of politics involved sometimes. Sometimes there is. I mean, if you want to build a nuclear bomb, having a nuclear plant is a big help. As they say in Flatbush, wouldn't do it. Yeah, but <laughs> do we really want people building more nuclear bombs? Well, the stagnation of the se sector continues. It sure does. two and a half gigawatts of new nuclear generation capacity came online last year com compared to 98 gigawatts of solar, two versus <laughs> ninety-eight, huh? That's forty percent, one fortieth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Renewable dollars continue to fall while nuclear continues to rise. Yeah. And the cost difference is having a huge impact on new generation. Yeah. And it says there's just two and a half gigawatts of new nuclear plants installed last year, compared to almost a hundred gigawatts. Yes. Of solar and sixty gigawatts of wind. The well, times they are changing. Yes, indeed. Okay. Well, let's take a look at Chicago. Huh? At Chicago. Whoops. Come on. Uh, you, there we go. I have to have the. Oh, uh, there we go. I have to have a computer that behaves, and this one does. Well, that's the skyline of the loop, and that building there is the Sears. Used to be the Sears Tower. Now it's it's the Willis Tower. Right. And at one time it was the tallest building in the world. At one time. Okay, this is from Renewable Energy Magazine. Have you got a title for the Dine, Dine Energy will power Chicago's Willis Tower with wind energy. So this that great big building is going to be powered by wind. 100%. Dynegy uh, entered into a multi-year contract with Chicago's iconic Willis Tower to provide 100% renewable electricity to the tower to the tower. The contract with Dynegy assures that 100% of Willis Tower's electricity will come from wind power and assures that the costs will remain constant. And well, that, it's appropriate because they call Ch Chicago the Windy City. They do, but this wind power is not from Chicago. It's going to well, come from wherever it comes pumping from. pumping it in, yeah. This is, no. It's a paper transfer. Well, it is. And, and, you know, for all we know, it could be coming from North Dakota. It's um, Well, there's a lot of wind in the Midwest. There is. And that's a big building. And uh, it's that is going to take a, a lot of, of, of wind to power yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. We, we got another picture coming we up. We are there. up to Saturday, the 26th of September. And this computer is once again behaving badly. Whoops. 
that isn't what I wanted to do. That is what I wanted. To do. No, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> I'm having trouble here? here, Tom. Oh, that was the next picture. Saturday, September 26th. And that is the correct picture, except that it's not moving. Yeah, and, and one of those pictures that came up here was moving. That's the one. There we go. There I put, we go. I put this into a different uh, w into a different window so that people could actually see You can see what's really happening there. Yeah. And, and look look at the change there. Here we go. Yeah, this is um, cumulative fire damage over the period of 2000 to 2020. And well, it shows nothing happening in Nevada, and we'll find out later that that's wrong. Well, it, it's it's only looking at three states. Yeah. So it, it's also it's not showing nothing at, happening not in Idaho. Not looking at Idaho, not looking at exactly. Nevada. Yep. And th fires are happening there too. Right. One thing that bothers me a little bit about this picture is that when it starts out, it starts out just showing the wind damage in twenty in, in the year 2000. So it's if you would oh, look yeah. you back see the, 20 the years changing in the bottom. Yeah, if you would look back 20 years from to show the damage that had already taken in place in 2000, this would show more uh, damage than than um, uh, it, it shows when the picture says 2000. And look at all of those. That means a lot of people are being displaced. A lot as of we people, will find out in, a in, lot of people are being displaced let's let's uh, read about this this particular item is from clean technica well the map says it's the cumulative burned area yeah okay and the article says six graphics explain the climate feedback loop fueling us fires but this is a good article to read There's a it, lot it's of, a it's, it's an important very informative article. It, it, this is only one of the six uh, feedback pieces Wildfires in the western U.S. and around the world are getting worse. Fires in Oregon, Washington, and California for the last month are off the charts compared to previous years. And the fire season is still not over. Actually, it just started. Just started, um, it's right. We, we, the same thing happened in Australia last year. It was like, it was like the, the fire season was unbelievable at, at the point where it normally began. Yeah, but it's a hoax. Uh -huh. Sadly, we this is just a preview of what's to come, and we and we are frittering away time. And I want I want to look at that picture, if you don't mind, Tom, because I want to make a point here. Well, you want to go back to the picture? Yes, please. Okay. There you go. If you look at that at the year two thousand, the the dark red stuff for two thousand is what has burned this year, that, and two thousand. Yeah. And the orangey stuff when we hit 2000 is the stuff that has burned in the previous 20 years. In the year 2000. What do you mean 2020? 2020. In the year 2020, 3% of California has burned. In 2020. In 2020. In California, California is state. averaging 0.75% per year burning down, which means that when you hit 2020 on that chart, if it looks like 15% of the state has burned down, it's because 15% of the state has burned down. Wow. That's not a joke. And guess what? It's not going to get better. As we will find out talking yeah. about Yeah. And th here, this brings me to a point, and I am going to write an article about this for Clean Technica. We may need to start doing geoengineering right now. In order Absolutely. to... Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, the kind of thing that I have in mind, and I say this every time I say geoengineering because people get it... Yeah, plant trees. Misunderstanding. I'm not talking about dumping chemicals out of airplanes. No, you're I'm talking, talking about planting trees and stuff. But also um, soil amendment with the idea of changing the natural environment. Uh -huh. Now, we had an article a couple of weeks ago about what was called nano clay where you just take clay and you you make it pulverize it until it's so fine yeah, it's amazing yeah. and then you dump that in in a in a in a very thin water slurry onto sand and all of a sudden you got soil soil it bonds with the sand okay what happens if you go into into desert areas and you start doing this what happens if you start well you stop having deserts exactly and if you stop having deserts 
the, if you have green out there, and a lot of things will grow green, and we are going to be talking about we'll that We'll talk later. about that. As We're going to be up. talking about acacia trees stopping the advance of the Sahara Desert. If you do that, you can change the entire environment. This is something... Well, Changing the desert into something green changes the changes the whole earth. Really. It changes everything. Yeah. It changes absolutely everything. But it's scary because we're going to be doing something we really don't understand. The problem is right now the carbon dioxide we're dumping into the atmosphere, we're doing something we really don't understand except for one thing. It's bad. Well, what's happening is money. Yeah. It's money, money talking. And the yeah. wrong people have the money. And the what? The wrong people have the money. Well, it shouldn't be about it. It should. It shouldn't be about money. It should be. Well, a, it shouldn't. But we're it should in be capitalism, about people. Guy. Yeah. Well, I I don't have a problem with capitalism if it's kept under control. But that's that's the, that's the see, whole thing. This is thing the problem right that the libertarians have, and it's a problem that that free market capitalists have. Every time I hit this, I think of a term which I, I think is not actually biblical, but it certainly feels biblical. It is in those days, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Say that again. In those days, every yeah. man did what was right in his own eyes. In other words, yeah, well, it's if, true. Yeah, but if if but he now felt, we we're not we got not men doing these things, but giant corporations. Right, and and the thing is, if people are allowed to do whatever they think is right, there's going to be people out there who say, well, the right thing is if I own everything. Yeah, we got a president that sort of thinks that way. I have a feeling that that's the case. <laughs> um, anyway. Should we go on for Yeah, this? we go on. We should okay. go on. We got a couple of fishes coming up. We here. do. We have fishies. Little fishies in the brook. Little fishies in the brook. This is fish in an artificial reef. And this also is an item from Clean Technica. And they're talking about building reefs. Well, it's an interesting concept. And there's some good pictures in this article, by the way. Oh, there's this a lot of, of good pictures article. in this article, yeah. New tech for artificial reefs increases marine life and vitality. An artificial reef is a human-made structure. Again, this is geoengineering, you see? It is, absolutely. Building artificial reefs is geoengineering. Um, it's an artificial structure that may mimic characteristics of a natural reef for ocean habitats. Several companies, uh, several, I think it's a bunch, uh, specialize in design, manufacture, and deployment of long-lasting artificial reefs. Typically, they're constructed of limestone, steel, or concrete. Sometimes they're sunken ships and old tires. Absolutely. So, Well, some of the real reefs are disappearing, so we have to do something, do something about, about it. About it. Yep. We are destroying nature, and so anything that we do that corrects things is going to be, is going to be geoengineering. Well, a quick takeaway from the article. Artificial reefs can improve fisheries production. Yes. Okay. Provide ecosystem restoration, which means which lots very of, important. Lots of crab meat. <laughs> and enhance water quality. And which means good oysters. Does yeah. <laughs> That's why I, I think I said this on the show. We could solve the world's problem if everybody ate oysters. Maybe <laughs> I, I don't remember that. Well, the shells use calcium carbonate. Yeah, that's so the right. shells store the CO2. Shells are, uh, oyster shells are carbon sinks. Yeah, same is true of clams. <laughs> same is true of a lot of things. Uh, you know, the shellfish, any any shellfish. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we got an interesting picture coming up. Yeah, here. I we guess do. We'll start all out with the picture, and there's the picture, and it's a hydrogen-powered plane. This is an item from uh, CNBC. The C, by the way, I think means commercial, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No, but it's a website. Yeah, it, it, it's a news, it, it's associated with NBC. Well, a hydrogen-powered passenger plane completes its maiden flight. Um, a hydrogen fuel a Zero Avia six-seater Piper M-class aircraft completed its maiden flight this week in another step toward low and zero emission flight. The next step will be a flight between 250 and 300 nautical miles, taking off from the Orkney Islands. Well, they're not, they're not using the hydrogen to, to run a motor. They're using the hydrogen to produce electricity. And the electricity will Runs run the motor. The motor right. And, and so basically, this is a fuel cell. 
It's a fuel cell. You're, you're taking exactly hydrogen in from a tank and oxygen from the air and combining them in a fuel cell, which is not combustion. It's just fuel cell stuff. Yeah. Which is, well, by the way, a technical term. Fuel cell stuff is a technical term. I'm glad you told me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's an interesting takeaway in the article. Yeah. Airbus has released details of hydrogen-fueled concept planes carrying as many as 200 passengers. Yes. So they're going after the they're, real they're planes absolutely, here. They're, they're going after this. Yeah. And they're talking about they could enter into service by the year 2035, which, which is, sounds like it's a long time away, but it's really not. When you're talking about 200, 250 passengers. That's a full-size airliner. Yeah. That's that's big. And oh. in addition, a European term firm has developed a fuel cell train. Yes. That, and, and we'll talk about we something will indeed. like that. We it's only indeed. steam and water. <laughs> <laughs> but steam, as you know, is a is a is a, um, a greenhouse gas. It can be. It can be, but it dissipates rapidly. It dissipates rather quickly, yes, yeah. like in a like few in a days. Rain, like in a rainstorm. Like in, all you got to do is have a rainstorm. <laughs> okay, our next item is, a nice picture is, is, uh, is um, from Motley Fool. Motley Fool is a, is a website that's devoted to, to advice on on uh, stock market stuff. I was going to say, it's, it's financial advice. Yeah, which yes. is why they, they call it Motley Fool. You can't take them to court and say, a motley fool told me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> By the way, motley refers to the uniform that a, yeah. a fool would wear. That's right. Which consisted of many, many colors. Yes. And by the way, a fool in, in medieval times was the only one who could tell the truth to the king. Uh, at times, that's true. <laughs> and some of them made a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And some of them got into a lot of trouble. Well, those, those are not just wind turbines, they're GE wind turbines. Yes, that's correct. And GE is dumping coal power and pivoting to wind. Isn't that interesting? This is important. It this is. is significant. This is significant. GE said it plans to stop building new coal power e uh, equipment. The decision didn't come as a surprise. Coal is going out of favor rapidly in many countries due to the status as one of the dirtiest fuels, along with the falling costs of cleaner sources of energy like natural gas, wind, and solar. And well, it's it's money again. It's, it's dollar signs. Absolutely, it's money, but it's also. But it's a good sign. Yeah, it is. It is a good development. It is a good sign. Well, just a few years ago, GE's coal-dependent power segment was one of the company's flagship businesses. Yeah. Okay, GE is now touting its new Heliod X wind turbines, which we'll talk about. Yeah. And the company announced a noteworthy order for 187 turbines at three U.S. wind farms earlier this week. Again, which we will be talking about. Right, right. These are on land wind farms. Yes, they're on land. But GE is selling a lot of wind turbines. I mean, well, a GE lot. GE has been in the... Earth and the land-based wind turbine business for a long time. Yeah. But they're just getting their feet wet offshore. Well, I'll tell you. And they're you. getting their feet wet pretty big. With big turbines. Big gigantic turbines. Gigantic turbines. Every time I turn around, I see a turbine that's bigger than the last one I heard about. <laughs> I was thinking They're the up same to 13 thing. megawatts now. Yeah. Well, 13 megawatts really is just a fat 12. <laughs> okay, it's a fat 12. <laughs> it was a 12 megawatt, and they, is, tw they tweaked it a little bit. Yeah, now, well, now it's 13. When you're at 12, tweaking it to 13 is not as hard as tweaking from 1 to 2. Oh, no, not at <laughs> all. No, these are significant. Well, I looked at the dimensions of one of these things, and the cell is big enough to put in three transit buses. Yeah. Three buses. It's, it's three like I said, the, the nacelle is big it. enough that you can live easily. It easily. Yeah, you could you could live if you designed it properly. You could live comfortably in it. Okay, we have an item here from LiveScience.com. What is that? What are we looking at? We're looking at the track of a hurricane. And if you look at it, it started out, it got bigger, it got smaller, it got bigger again. Yes, which that's is right. why we call it a zombie storm. It it started those. Wherever the, this started in the lower right corner of the picture, just off the coast right of Africa. Right off the coast of Africa. And if you look at this, you can tell um, what it's doing because they, the the um, the uh, little, little dots, no, dots tell along story. the line tell the story. It, it, they are taken at even amounts uh, uh, of time, 
and they if they're triangular it means you've got a storm if it's a, if it's a circle a circular dot it means that it's a hurricane so when it started out it was kind of a fast moving storm which then suddenly in the mid atlantic ocean slowed down in terms of forest forward motion but got bigger or more stronger and it became a hurricane and then it it went all the way up to the upper um, left where you can see um, Nova Scotia is in the in the uh, in the map in the oh yeah uh, yeah yep, yep, there it corner. is that's and it was a hurricane and Nova then, Scotia Newfoundland yep and then it it became a storm again it became less powerful and then it started meandering all over the place went south which is a little bit unusual and then off you know between the azores and the Canary was Islands, around there of, for a good week wasn't it yeah and and two, three days after this this uh, map was made i came across this thing again it had reformed into a storm again wow so and then it dissipated now this 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 is this isn't supposed to happen. It's this is a zombie storm. That's what they call it. That's yep. what they call it, and it happened that They're we had rising a, from the dead. Yes, that's right. Thanks to climate change. So, what do you got from a? Um, I just read oh, it. you just read that. <laughs> zombie storms, which return to life after petering out, are new addition this year. An undead weather anomaly um, are the becoming more common thanks to climate change. One example was tropical storm Paulette. A hurricane that petered o o petered out only to return. Well, I read again what you just basically said. Earlier this month, tropical storm Paulette formed in the Atlantic, made landfall in Bermuda as a Category One hurricane. It then strengthened over land into Category Category Two. It weakened and died five and a half days later, and then it regained strength and became a tropical storm once more near the Azores. And as the, of this article, it has now become a post-tropical cyclone. And cyclone is just what they call hurricanes in other parts of the world. Yeah, but post-tropical cyclone, some yeah, it's still go. It's, it's still, still going. happening. Well, okay. not anymore. But that was that was as of Monday of this week, though. Yep. And now we've got an item from the Japan Times More about zombies. zombies, zombie <laughs> forests in Siberia. Forests and climate change. Stokes zombie fires. Yeah, we don't have a picture for this, but in the marshy clearing of a sprawling Siberian forest, a small cohort of volunteers. There were a bunch of pictures with this with this article. There were a bunch of pictures. Yeah, but we um, just didn't have. We I didn't have put them. any of them in. Um, uh, We've a, talked about this. Yeah, a small cohort of volunteers battle winter-resistant underground blaze. It's a growing problem in Russia. In some places, peat has smoldered underground for about five years, and it can reemerge, set fire to dry grass, and spread rapidly. Well, from the article, it says, Lying dormant three feet beneath the Earth's surface, the fire can survive the Siberian winters because of low groundwater levels. Right. After winter, when the summer temperatures soar, the fires can return from the dead. Yep. And this, peat fires are a particular threat to the climate because of the large quantities of carbon dioxide they release. Right. And peatland is much more complicated to extinguish than conventional forest fires. Oh yeah. You know much. they put these. They think they got the fire out, and it comes back to life. That happened. When That's why they call them I, zombies. I think it was when I was a kid. It might have been be even before I was born, but there was a, an old timer in Northfield, Massachusetts, who was telling me about a forest, uh, not, not a forest fire, a fire in Northfield that was out in the in the countryside. Uh, it was on a farm site or something like that, but there was a barn that burned down or some, whatever. And a year later, the farm next door had a building burned down. And they figured out that the fire had gone underground over the course of that day. And it was just sitting there underground burning and nobody even knew it. That's right. Wow. And that, it just can't happen. It can't happen everywhere. It's got to have fuel buried underground that can burn, or smolder. Well, that is happening in a lot of the places where there is uh, permafrost. Yes. And the permafrost is thawing out. Yes. And it's burning. Yes. Okay, we're up to Monday, uh, we September 28th. we got a picture 28th. coming up here. 
And we have a picture of a wildfire, and as I said last time... Is that what that is? Yeah, it looks pretty wild to me, let me tell you. As I said last time, I hate putting these pictures up. You know, it's, it's like you've seen one, you've seen them all, but nevertheless... Well, the, climate change may spark serial Washoe wildfires. This is scary. And Washoe is northern, northwestern New Mexico. Yeah. And it borders California and Oregon, and they're... They're involved. I mean, it's the same fires, but they're just not on the map. Right. Um, within 20 years, northern Washoe County, Nevada, may become the epicenter of uh, persistent wildfire fires driven by higher temperatures and prevalent drought do, uh, brought about by climate change. The prediction is one of several grim conclusions based on analysis of climate change. There's a lot of good pictures <clears throat> in this article, by the way. Yes. And changes in climate have happened for thousands of years. Duh. The latest temperature increases have been accelerated by atmospheric carbon propagated by burning fossil fuels. Yeah. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> if you listen to this show, you know that. But the last sentence is a practice we must discontinue. I guess. Okay, we've got a picture now that comes from the BBC. And well, this, I... is, this is kind of nice. I would have never figured that was England. Oh, you get into the Lake District and places like that. Well, yeah, like that. I, it's, I don't know. You, you've lived over there, so you do know it. Yeah, Lake I, District is up in the northwest near Scotland. It's in the northwest, and most of the time I was either in the southeast or the southwest, in Cantor, in, in Devonshire. But um, th this picture, I really love this picture. It's nice. It, it does not look to me like England at all. Well, it doesn't to a lot of people, I'm sure. But uh, Wales, for crying out loud, northern Wales looks like the Alps. Well, this is further north than but Wales. It, the mountains in the, in northern Wales are about you know a, a twenty percent of the height of the of the mountains in the Alps. But but they look like they, the Alps. they're shaped like that. This picture, Tom, look at this. That thing in the middle of the sky, what is it? It's an unidentified flying object. But I have figured out a little bit about it. <laughs> There's something there. It's a bug. <laughs> is that what it is? A bug? I'm sure it is because bug on a camera lens. It's a, not on the camera lens. It's out in the out in front of the camera. It's a pretty big bug. The whole yeah, it's a pretty big bug. the The whole picture is in focus except that one thing, <laughs> which means that it's, it's at a different closer. distance than everything yeah. else. So it's not uh, it's not like an airplane over the flying over the mountains. It's it's just a it's a bug. Anyway, that's the Lake District, and this is from the BBC. And what do you got for a well, Boris Johnson, who's the man? <laughs> yeah. Promises to protect 30% of UK's land by 2030. Yes, an extra 400,000 hectares, which is, I'm thinking That's about... a million a acres. million acres, yeah. Of English countryside will be protected to support the recovery of nature under plans by Boris Johnson. He will make the commitment at a virtual UN event. He's joining 65 leaders who pledged to reverse losses in the natural world by 2030. There's a short video in this. It's a BBC thing, and the BBC usually does a pretty good job. They usually do. And Johnson has said that biodiversity loss is happening today at a frightening rate. Yeah. And he says, we can't afford to dither and delay. Yeah. And that's significant. That we is. can't. Yes. I wish that, you know, Boris Johnson seems to have got along in the past pretty well with Donald Trump. I wish well, he, he almost would... looks like Trump. Yeah. He's got I... a wild flock of a uh, shock of yeah. blonde hair. But I wish that he would kind of get this into Donald Trump's mind. I don't know that Donald Trump even has him. <laughs> I was listening to him last I, night. I have, I have lost all hope for Donald Trump. Well, last night he didn't come across too well. No, you're talking I, about I the debate. I could listen to it. The debate. Wasn't the debate the night before last? Yeah, it was. It was yeah. Tuesday. Yeah, I'm listening to it, and I, I just had to turn it off. The, you know, the all, news, all this guy was doing was ranting. Constantly. Yeah. I mean, the, the rules of a debate say you say something, the other guy says something. You say something, he says something. Well, he was doing that on purpose. He he was trying to, to screw Biden up, I, and it I didn't don't, work. I don't think he was doing it on purpose. I think he was just being... Well, he obsessive. said in advance that that was exactly what he was going to do. Oh, did he? Yeah, he he was trying to prove to the world that uh, Biden was incompetent. Well, he proved that work. he was a four-year-old. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, the whole thing reminded me. I didn't watch it. It didn't. I, it it didn't help him at all. It reminded me of his son, 
at an interview who was very angrily accusing liberals of being impolite. <laughs> he said, conservatives don't act like that. <laughs> this is Trump Jr. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, should we go on? Yeah, this is an interesting one. The ancient trade holding back the Sahara Dres and, Desert. And this was fascinating. We were talking, we mentioned this earlier, the thing about acacia trees. This is from the BBC, and it's got a nice picture with it that I just... We don't have a picture. I don't here. have it here. Um, with climate change, the Sahara Desert has grown about 100 kilometers southward since 1950. Now, that means 60 miles in 70 years. It um, is expected to keep growing. Now, acacia trees, whose gum has been prized for its unusual culinary and me medicinal uses, are part of the, a continent-wide effort to hold back the Sahara Desert. And here, we're talking about geoengineering again. Absolutely. That's exactly what this we're talking about. This is a bunch of, if you look at the, at the coast of West Africa, below the Sahara, there's a bunch of countries in there. Well, it's 5,000 miles, and that's what we're talking about yeah. in this article. They're going, to, they're going to plant trees. There are a lot of countries involved here, and they're, they're looking at this and they're saying, we're losing almost a mile of arable land every year for the entire yes. width of the country. Well, that's about to change. And that's me, what they're trying read to change. something from the article here. Yeah, go ahead. The, 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 the uh, gum they're talking about is called gum Arabic. Right. It's been around for a long, long time. Long time. Okay, and it spills out naturally from wounds in the acacia tree. Right. And its harvesting has become, it's always been, an important source of income. So they've been trading this gum Arabic for millennia across yeah. this region. Another reason to plant the trees. Now the African Union has a great green wall project, which right. is going to plant thousands of hectares of acacia, cre of acacia, creating a new forest spanning the entire African continent, 5,000 miles, they're, which they're, will slow the progression of the desert. They're building a forest 5,000 miles long. That's a good-sized forest, guys. That's a good <laughs> Even if it's only a, a mile or two wide, it's a good-sized forest. And yeah. it's, it's more than that. And these acacia too. trees are very resistant to drought. Yes. That's one well, of the Well, this is of kind of an arid area, but they've it, been thriving there for centuries. Yes. Okay, we should well, keep going. We've got an going. interesting picture here. Yeah, I'm this is, we've talked about this before, but it came up again in the news. And I this thought it would be nice to remind This is an interesting, very people. interesting concept. This is a, an article from Princeton University, and they published it because... Solar panels in a box. Yes, they published this article because... Uh, uh, Angel, Angelo Campus is a is a Princeton alumnus. So and that's that's the guy's name. That's the it's guy's name. It's not about it's a campus. It's about a guy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, Angelo Campus electrifies the renewable energy business with Box Power, which is the name of his company. And that is a brilliant concept, really. Yeah, the box you can see there. It's under the solar panels. It's a shipping container. The, a couple of guys are walking out of it with a solar panel. Princeton There's alumnus. There's a video in this, and you can see them building this. Yes. And it's like a fast mo motion, you know. Yes. These guys all look like the Keystone Cops. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many people watching this show know what the Keystone Cops were. <laughs> Boy, we knew about them when I was a kid, I can tell you that, but that was a long time ago. Well, there's an interesting two-minute video, which is worth searching for. You have to look for it. Yeah. But it's there, and it's... It's, the, it's exactly this, this picture that you're looking at, yeah. but in fast motion. Well, let me read this. Princeton alumnus Angelo Campus built a business called Box Power to ensure that those who need quick access to power can find it in a simple configuration. A shipping container equipped with solar panels, a battery for energy storage, and a backup generator. Well, as the article said, it's a containerized microgrid. That's right. Okay. That's exactly what it was. A sustainable alternative to diesel alternators. That's what I was using when I did uh, did my my uh, blog uh, the night before last. I was using a, a, a microgrid. In a, in a small version of it. It was a yep. tiny microgrid, yep. you know, with with a couple of, of 12 volt, 20 amp, 4 amp batteries, a 60 volt solar panel, which obviously at four o'clock in the morning was not in, producing any electricity. Uh, well, these guys aren't fooling around. They're making these things now from three and a half kilowatts, which is really about this size, all the way up to 528 kilowatts, a half a megawatt. Yeah. Okay, and just, just for what it's worth, 
the uh, installation in Brattleboro is five megawatts. The so big installation. A half a megawatt is significant. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, it, and, and that's you can something install that, it in less than a day. And that that's something that just can be rolled into place. Bingo. And there it is. In a day, you're set up. Yeah. The only thing is, in order to make use of this on a widespread basis, yeah, the grid has to be divisible into into areas that can function as microgrids. Well, that's going to happen eventually, just it's because it, it, it makes sense. But it, it's, it's, gonna, distri it's, it's gonna called be distributed power. Much we're going to be much better off if it happens because somebody plans it, than if it happens because it's necessary to make it work while we have a power out. Well, you're right there. It it is going to happen because it's the natural progression of things. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea of giant generating stations and big transmission lines is the past. Yep. Okay. Okay, well, we have an picture item coming up and this we, is very interesting. Yeah, this is a, a a an article from Triple Pundit and that, ladies and gentlemen, is Pittsburgh. That's a funicular railway in Pittsburgh, and there's one just like it on Mount Washington. Funicular. And what it is, it, it there's, there's three rails, and the central rail is cogs. Yeah. And this thing runs up the cogs and down the cogs. Yeah. That's a and cute I've little... been in Pittsburgh many, many times, and I never even knew that thing was there. That's a cute little car, isn't it? <laughs> and it, it's parallel to the earth, so you sit there and you're you're sitting normal. It, it looks like it's 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 stuck up in the air and it's not. Yeah, if that ever ran onto a level ground, the ramp, feel the very ramp is crooked. Weird. Okay. Well, cities announced massive fossil fuel divestments. This is significant. Last week, twelve cities around the world announced a commitment to div to divest of fossil fuels looking toward a green, a green and just recovery from COVID-19. Los Angeles and New York signed the declaration. Importantly, and perhaps surprisingly, so did New Orleans and Pittsburgh. Well, that's the point of this. Everybody yes. would have expected New York and Los Angeles to get on, but now we're talking about lesser sized cities also getting on the bandwagon. Well, New York um, and Los Angeles is easy, but Pittsburgh, we're talking about an area, a state that's been heavily dependent on coal. I was just going to say, what do you think about when you think about Pittsburgh? It's coal. Right? Yeah. And and, and, then, and New Orleans has oil. Exactly. Exactly. Offshore oil. Okay. We have to keep going. Uh, and we've got an item from PV Tech. And we've got another picture coming and up And we have here. a picture of a solar farm in Spain. Oh, come on. Oh, the picture's up already. The picture's <laughs> there. Well, why isn't it on the screen? Why? There we go. go. <laughs> ah, renewable energy among the most pandemic resilient infrastructure subsectors. The renewable sector is among the most pandemic resilient infrastructure subsectors, thanks in part to its ability to secure finances as well as government efforts to grow the green economy, according to a white paper from investment firm Foresight Group. You know, I think a lot of the reason why this particular kind of business is resilient in COVID-19 is that everything happens outdoors. All this renewable stuff is going on outdoors. Yeah. If you look at coal mines, you've got people in confined spaces and if one of them gets sick, you're going to have a problem. And the same thing is true of nuclear plants. The article really plants. didn't say much about that. I know, but, but I think it's important. Absolutely. Same thing is true of nuclear plants. And, and I think if some guy in a coal mine gets get CV-19. Everybody in a coal mine gets CV-19. This is something that they've been worried about. Okay. Uh, well, renewables, due to, decline, to declining levelized cost of energy, yep. are a strategic pillar of the U EU's post-COVID economy. Right. Okay. Yep. So let's okay. move along. Here we got Wednesday. a train. We're up to Wednesday, September 30th, and I did a wise guy caption on this Hydroflex. Uh, Hydroflex That's with cast factory original graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that look like, a, you know, the, the, the they, double they, A they local? They beat the vandals to the act. Yeah, it looks like the double A local in Manhattan. You know, one of those awful uh, local trains. It looks like a subway, but it's not. But it also looks like it's graffiti covered. <laughs> okay, this is from well, Energy Live News. All aboard. UK's first hydrogen-powered train starts trial journeys today, and that was last week. Yeah, 
the first ever hydrogen powered train will start running in the UK main line today. Today's trials of the train named Hydroflex follow almost two years of development work and more than a million pounds of investment by both Potterbrook and the University of Birmingham. Birmingham. Birmingham, Birmingham they would say. <laughs> the technology deployed in a train will be available by 2023. So it's come up pretty quick it's, to yeah. retrofit current in-service trains. Well, that's a, that's an important issue. They can they can use this. I mean, they, they're using third rails in the UK for electric trains. Well, not trains. in this case. This, this no. has to be a diesel train. Yeah, but they no can... Because there's no overhead, there's no, there's no third rail. No third nothing. rail. In this case, they're, they're running this on a track that was probably diesel, but it doesn't matter. The point is that any train that you've got, if it's electric, you can install... Uh, a um, um, hydrogen fuel cell. If it's diesel, you can replace the locomotive with a hydrogen fuel, fuel cell. Well, the next phase is going to be a hydrogen and battery powered module yes. that can be fitted underneath the train. Yeah. Okay, so they're getting ready. Yeah. Okay, our next item is from BBC. And it says, uh, it has a picture, oh, we got a of, picture a, here. of a flower. Yeah, I'm going right by the picture. And I don't know what the flower is. I actually did It looks did like a daylily. It's not a daylily. No, it's, it looks like one. Yeah. A little bit different color. Yeah. It's um, sort of a daylily, but it's a different color then. So what do you got for a title? Fla uh, hmm. Two-fifths two of plants at risk of extinction. This is a scary headline. It is. Two-fifths of the world's plants are at risk of extinction, scientists have warned. Researchers say they're racing against time to name and describe new species before they disappear. Plants hold huge promise as medicines, fuels, and foods, says a report by the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew. And of course, one thing about these plants is a lot of these plants, that they, if they know that they're going to face extinction, they can save, save seeds. Why, why aren't you up here? I am. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. But you're not up here. Up there. Oh, behind us. I have no idea. <laughs> I can't get you up there. Put both of us up and see what happens. Not happening. <laughs> Weird. Well, look at the picture for a while. Oh, I, I know why. It's because that isn't a reflection of what's on television. That's a reflection of what's on this computer. Okay. Um, so, so what do you want here? You, I was saying... So um, we, we can get you up there? Or? One thing, that is not... Uh, we'll talk about it after the show. Um, <laughs> we, we have, oh, okay. We, that's the, Yeah, okay. That's normal. Um, one thing about plants is that we can save seeds. And we have one more item, and we have one minute to finish the show. Well, oh, let me. There's a quick takeaway here. Go ahead. Only a small proportion of existing plant species are used as foods and biofuels. Very small. Seven hundred plants used in medicine are at risk of extinction, with over harvesting a problem in many parts of the world. Right. A main driver of plant extinction is clearance of natural habitats. Right. So this is a big problem. There's a message behind what we yeah. said here. Yeah. Okay, our last item is from Renews, and it is about, believe it or not, a United States offshore wind farm. Well, let's see here. We've got a picture here. We do indeed. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to get the picture up. There you go. There we go, by Joe. There well, you I go. I think he's got it. Yeah. Dominion unleashes Coastal Virginia. Coastal Virginia is the name of... Uh, the development. Offshore wind farm. The offshore wind farm. Dominion Energy commenced uh, operations at its 12 megawatt coastal Virginia offshore wind farm in the U.S. Ersted oversaw installation of the offshore projects, com offshore components, and the U.S. developer, including uh, for the U.S. developer, including turbines and foundations, while Dominion Energy offshore uh, oversaw the offshore aspects. There's an interesting two-minute video showing the construction of one of those things. Right. And this is a pilot project, by the way. It's only got two turbines. Two turbines. It's our second offshore wind farm in the United States after the... After the uh, but they're planning a huge yes. replacement with... Uh, it's about 2,000 times bigger. Yes. Yeah. With... Uh, I don't have the I don't have the number of 
turbines, but it's huge. It's a lot. So They're putting them up all, all the entire east coast of the United States, from uh, North Carolina up to Maine. Is, well, we've talked about that yeah. already. It, this is going to be a big project. This it's is going to be a big project. So we have reached the end of the show. It is time to say goodbye. And um, so we are hoping that you will have a perfectly lovely week. And goodbye from us. See you next time. Adios.